And here we are again. We're just going to jump right back into our, our conversation about how to assess the health of an ecosystem. And so now we're going to talk about the biological piece. And the first thing we're going to look at is biodiversity. And what that is talking about is just really how many species are in an ecosystem. Our assumption for that is that the more species, the more diverse it is, the healthier and more stable the ecosystem is going to be. And so I've got a little picture of a few different diverse ecosystems. Uh, whatever it is we're talking about, if it's more diverse, we assume it's got a more complicated food web happening into in it. And what that means is that it's going to be more stable because if something happens to that ecosystem, let's say it's a natural event like a volcano or a hurricane or something happens and some of the members of this uh, ecosystem are, are damaged or migrate out, the whole system has still got options and there's other feeding pathways and energy pathways they can take. And so that's one reason that uh, more diverse systems are usually more resilient and, and more stable systems. Uh, also, we're going to be looking at what's called an indicator species. And what that is, so here's what I wrote down, presence of a certain type of organism can tell us a lot about the health of an ecosystem. So if we know a species is really sensitive and we find that species in the ecosystem and we know that that species can't tolerate a lot of you know, extreme conditions, it tells us that that ecosystem's in good shape. For example, here's a, the northern spotted owl. It needs uh, old growth forests to, to survive. And so if you go into an area and you find the northern spotted owl, you can go ahead and put all your fancy equipment and probes away because you know just the presence of that species tells us that the ecosystem's in good shape. Stories for later, I actually used to be on a spotted owl crew. And, so that, and that was what we looked, like, looked at. We looked for, if we could find the spotted owls, it, it was a really good sign. Uh, along the same lines, uh, amphibians in general are, are a lot of the times uh, indicator species because they're so sensitive, you know, they breathe through their skin, uh, and so they're really, you know, particular to just, just humidity levels and that. And so this is a California tree frog right here, and if that little guy, if we find that guy at uh, Arroyo de Oro Creek next week, uh, it's going to be a great sign. And it just tells us that everything's A-OK. -okay. Uh, on the flip side, if we find bullfrogs, which are voracious, invasive predators, uh, then, you know, the, the deal's over. Uh, so if it's a native species, bullfrogs will eat these little guys for breakfast, a bunch of them. Bullfrogs will eat, will eat like, small mammals, too. Uh, and then here's, uh, there's also a lot of insect larvae. Uh, or, or nymphs, uh, a lot of insects start their lives in water. And so this is a stonefly nymph, uh, which is a sensitive species. So if we find that at Arroyo de Oro, it's a really good sign. On the flip side, if we find mosquito larvae, which are actually pretty cool to look at, look at I mean, mosquito larvae can grow in puddles. So those are really tolerant species. And so if we find those, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad, uh, you know, it's a bad place, but it just means it's just in and of itself, it's not, you know, it doesn't tell us it's a great, uh, it's the ecosystem's in great shape. So we've got our tolerant species, medium tolerance, and intolerant. So tolerant means they can take a beating, they can take some abuse. And so we're talking about like cockroaches and pigeons and rats and, and midge larvas and, and little, you know, things like that, that are, they can be anywhere. Um, and so they're in, and it's okay if they're there, but what we really want to see are these intolerant species, the super sensitive species. And so again, to the spotted owls, if we see the spotted owl, it's a great sign. Um, if you've been to the Sierras, maybe you recognize this bird, it's a stellar jay, and they're, they're, they call them the cheeseburger birds because they go cheeseburger. Uh, as, as they're called, but they're, they're everywhere and, and they're, they're common and so um, a more tolerant species or just like around town, uh, if you see pigeons, you know, it's not the best sign. Finally, uh, so indicator species are really good. The presence of a keystone species is also a big deal and what that is is uh, a species that really has multiple links into the ecosystem. And so I got a couple examples for you. But first, they call it a keystone because back in like the, the, the ancient Rome, before they were using mortar to build their buildings, this is like a doorway here, right? And, they, and so, I mean, it's pretty incredible architecture, but that top green piece there was called the keystone. And so if you take that piece out, the whole thing falls apart. There's no glue, there's no plaster, or anything like that. It's just all very carefully engineered. And so they take that concept and they apply it to species. And so for example, here we've got the African elephant. 
uh, which we, you know, who doesn't love elephants? But really, uh, they, they play a, a vital role in African ecosystems because elephants, what they do is they rip out trees, which seems like at first glance it would be really destructive. But if you, like all the, you know, planet Earth shows you've ever seen or it shows like the African savanna, uh, a big reason that that, that that is there is because the elephants has, have ripped out the trees. The trees are always trying to come back and the elephants just rip them out and they allow the grasslands to stay there and that grass is super important for all different kinds of creatures all the you know from uh, the the cheetahs and the gazelles and the zebras and the ostriches and rhinos and all the things that are eating each other baboons and termites and dung beetles by the way I took all this from uh, there's a website down here you can grab it I stole it from uh, that place so just to give credit where credit is due but but it, it is a great example of a keystone species another one that I know your book talks about uh, is uh, the sea otter and so these guys eat sea urchins which look like they're pretty hard to eat uh, but that's really important because what happens is uh, these guys you know they live in the Pacific too the sea urchins will uh, eat kelp they, they eat lots of kelp, and those kelp forests support just a ton of uh, other creatures. And if you want to see, you're like, how do, how do these things eat? If you want to check it out, take that link. It's a little YouTube. It's only like 20-second 20, 20 YouTube link. But it shows a, a sea urchin eating kelp. It's pretty cool. They've got like a little mouth, and they have their kind of like tentacles that bring the kelp in. But so the fact that if you take these river or these, uh, these otters out, these sea urchins multiply and then they take down the kelp forest and now all those, you know, that, that kelp habitat's gone and it has, you know, huge ramifications for all the, the creatures that are depending on it. So, there we have it. Three biological things we're looking for. Biodiversity, the indicator species, and then the keystone species, which could be an indicator species and also help with biodiversity. So uh, that, that's what we've got. Uh, I hope you can find some time to do a summary on that. And we'll, we'll be applying uh, these, uh, I guess, kind of these concepts to, our, to the Arroyo de Oro ecosystem next week. All right. Thanks, everybody, for sticking with me. We'll see you next time.